Welcome everybody to our panel on the role of the Senate. Uh, we're going to do our best here, uh, kind of uh, on our maiden voyage with this technology. At least uh, the the role of the Senate uh, is obviously kind of a wide ranging topic. For the framers, democracy, of course, was actually a pejorative term uh, because every democracy. Uh, that had existed in their t uh, prior to their time had failed. So the Senate is part of what made uh, the Constitution a Republican document rather than a Democratic one. And it allows smaller uh, uh, states and citizens in smaller states uh, to have a voice in the decisions of the national government rather than having those decisions made by representatives only of larger states. And I would suggest that it continues to play that role today. Along with the Electoral College, it, it serves to, to, to hold the country together again. People in the United States felt that they really had no voice in the national government. But we're, we're gonna have a bunch of differing views today and we have a, a panel that's both experienced, I think, and erudite as to the subject we're going to be talking about. Uh, first panelist uh, I'll mention is Professor Sanford Levinson from the University of Texas Law School. <clears throat> he also teaches in the Department of Government at the University of Texas. He holds degrees from Duke University, Stanford, as well as a PhD from Harvard. Uh, he is certainly one of the most thoughtful and knowledgeable people in the country on subjects related to government and to the Senate. We have with us Amanda Neely, General Counsel of, uh, uh, for Senator Rob Portman in the United States Senate, also Deputy Chief Counsel for the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. Uh, and she clerked for one of the, the great judges in the Court of Appeals, David Sentel. She's a, uh, a graduate of Princeton and Duke University Law School. Next, we have John Yu, who is a professor of law at Berkeley Law School. And John and I actually worked together in, of all places, the United States Senate about 25 years ago. And uh, I got there before John did, but John, John definitely uh, made an impression with his energy and his ability when he arrived as counsel for Chairman Hatch at the time. I was working for Senator Spencer Abraham uh, in the 104th Congress and, and John joined us towards the end of that. It's great to have him here today. He's a graduate of Yale and uh, Harvard Co Yale Law School and Harvard College. And uh, Lynn Baker also from the University of Texas Law School, Professor Lynn Baker. She's a prolific writer. She has degrees from Yale Law School, Yale College, as well as Oxford. And she clerked for one of the most respected judges in the Federal Circuit Courts, Amalia Kurse. So why don't we get started with opening statements from our panelists. Uh, I think <laughs> Professor Levinson may have stepped away for a moment, so I'm going to move down to Amanda, if I may. Uh, are you ready to, to speak, Amanda? I sure am, and okay. I will just, <laughs> that's great, and I'll you apologize. Thanks, Judge. Uh, I'll apologize a second in advance. My computer has frozen a couple of times in the middle of your speech, so um, if it happens again, just please bear with me. Um, so uh, thank you. to to the Federalist Society for hosting this and forging ahead, even though we've had some technical difficulties and I'm having some technical difficulties right this second. I, um, I'm so sorry, I don't know what's going on here with my computer. If you guys can just give me two seconds to try to fix the problem that I'm having right now. Sure, sure. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, things seem to be kind of coming in and out here. Okay, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, why don't we go to Professor Levinson while you work on that? Well, okay. if, sure, thank you. I'm, I'm right. sorry, things just seem a little yeah, you're frozen. Off the hook. You're off the hook for now. Oh, we're actually, you know what, if, 
it's working again. And my remarks sort of are an opening statement for this whole panel. So let me see if I can all right, proceed all if that's right. okay. Give another try. Thanks, Judge. Okay, so thank you to the Federal Society for organizing the symposium and forging ahead with the online format. And especially to the University of Michigan Law School student chapter, you guys have done a great job organizing everything, particularly with all the changes. And Judge, thank you for that kind introduction. Before I begin remarks, I'll offer the standard government caveat. The opinions I share do not necessarily reflect those of Senator Portman or the Senate. As the opening act on this panel, I'd like to offer some context for our discussion of the proper role of the Senate and our modern democracy. And given that this is a law student conference and your focus has likely been on torts or contracts lately, it might be reasonable for you to ask, why are we even having this discussion? And if that's you, you have been missing a hot debate. It's a debate that started during the Constitutional Convention and with today's polarization in the Congress, it has picked up some steam. On one hand, some people argue that the Senate should be abolished. And if not abolished, it should become a wholly majoritarian institution with proportional representation of state populations, just like the House. That was the anti-federalist position back in the day. Others argue that we need to repeal the Seventh Amendment and return to state legislatures, choosing senators to give state government a stronger voice in Washington. On its face, this is a debate about the structure of the Senate. But more deeply, it's about the very nature of our government. It's about whether we want an entirely majoritarian, winner-takes-all government, or a government that values and protects minority viewpoints. And I'd like to offer some of the history underpinning these arguments to give a framework for the ensuing discussion that I know our um, academic panelists here are going to, um, to delve into. As I hope all of you know, our system is a federalist system. Our nation was birthed by people who have been oppressed by a strong central government in their homelands. They came to the new world for the express purpose of removing that central authority from their lives so they could exercise their God-given individual liberties. In the wake of the Revolutionary War, the country had a surge of national feeling and is a pragmatic realization that the states needed a stronger national government to represent them abroad. And that led to the ratification of the Constitution on June 21st, 1788. Although the new federal government was stronger than the previous version of the Articles of Confederation, it was replete with points of friction designed to protect individual liberty and prevent the majority from running roughshod over the minority. In particular, on the federal level, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches were all meant to check each other. And then there's the federalist system whereby both the federal and state governments had their own th authorities within the same system. Article one of that new constitution created the legislative branch in two parts, the House and the Senate. The House would be composed of members elected directly by the people of their states every two years and members would be apportioned among the states based on population. The Senate would be comprised of two senators from each state chosen every six years by the state legislatures. In Federalist 62, Madison praised state legislature selection of senators. He said that giving state legislatures the power to choose senators provided a double advantage, both favoring a select appointment and of giving the state governments such an agency in the formation of the federal government as must secure the authority of the former. And the framers clearly believe the equal representation of the Senate was critical to the structure of our government. They took pains to ensure that it would be nearly impossible to change state's equality of representation. Article five of the constitution states, no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. And I imagine it would be difficult to convince most smaller states to voluntarily give up their equal voting power. And that was the system that remained in place for the next 125 years. In 1913, two constitutional amendments significantly changed the structure of both the federal government and the Senate. The 16th Amendment provided that Congress could collect income taxes without apportionment among the states. Previously, Article I required apportionment, meaning that each state, regardless of how poor or rich the state was or the size of its population, 
would have to pay the same proportion of a direct tax as every other state. As you might imagine, that would not be particularly popular in poor or less populated states. Effectively, that severely limited tax collection by the federal government. And as we all know, money means power. Without a significant source of revenue, the federal government's power was limited. But in 1913, Congress was able, under the 16th Amendment, to begin collecting income tax. That was an enormous expansion of Congress's power. And as we can see today by the amount of policy measures implemented through tax policy and the amount of direct spending. And that new source of funds helped fuel the rise of the bureaucracy that we have today. A few months later, the 17th Amendment was ratified. And the 17th Amendment provided for the direct election of senators by state populations rather than the appointment of state legislatures. And that change was driven by several concerns about state legislative appointment. State legislators frequently would reach an impasse in appointing senators, so seats would remain vacant for a, a length of time. And then money was flowing into state level races, not necessarily because of interest in the state legislators themselves, but about who they would appoint to the Senate. Um, the state legislative elections largely became focused on that one issue. And uh, you could see a parallel actually between um, last presidential cycle when then candidate Trump provided a list of potential Supreme Court justices as part of his campaign to sway the electorate. Um, so those two amendments effectively created the Congress that we have today. And that brings me to the role the Senate plays in both the federal system and with, in relation to the state governments. A Virginia delegate to the Constitutional Convention, Edmund Randolph, said that the Senate was meant to restrain, if possible, the fury of democracy. And that's what it does, sometimes a little too well. In the federal government, the House is a majoritarian body. There, the majority always wins. The minority has very few rights or an ability to influence the proceedings. The Senate, on the other hand, is entirely focused on the minority. Under the Senate rules and customs, one senator can delay and sometimes prevent the whole body from taking action. In relation to the states, while the House represents the people as originally conceived, the Senate gave voice to the state governments. And even after the 17th Amendment, the Senate still represents the states. Senators represent entire states, which should act as a moderating force because the whole population is electing them. And it's a bigger voting pool. And importantly, those state lines can't be gerrymandered like congressional districts. And it is still a body where all states are equal. They all have two votes. As I mentioned, there have been calls for change in the Senate to make it more like the House, another majoritarian institution that represents states proportionally without all of the Senate's traditional safeguards for minority rights. And although I, though I do believe we need to thoughtfully consider potentially reforms to features that enable obstruction instead of thoughtful debate, eliminating protection of minority views in the Senate would be a dangerous course. It would lead to less thoughtful legislation. It could reduce what little collegiality is left, and it could eliminate states' voices in the debate. And I believe that Montana, Alaska, Rhode Island, all have differing and valuable interests that should be taken into account. Rather than overhauling the Senate to give the Congress more power to move quickly and yield to majoritarian impulses, to best protect citizens and individual liberty, we need to lean back into that federalist system. Although our system can be frustrating, and slow, it prevents the federal government from seizing absolute power. An entirely majoritarian Congress combined with a president of the same party would be unchecked. So contrary to yielding to those majoritarian impulses, I argue that Congress should act as a stronger check on the executive branch and take back its power from the regulatory agencies so that laws truly reflect the will of the people elected through through elected officials, and then Congress should yield back much of the authority it has assumed over the years back to the state governments, which are more capable of seeing and acting upon the needs and desires of their own citizens. The more we push power to the states, as the framers intended, the less heated Washington will be, and perhaps Congress would be able to turn its attention to doing fewer things, but doing the big things well. <laughs>
Both of those features of a healthy federalist system would improve the common good and better protect individual liberty. Thanks. Thank you, Amanda, for those very thoughtful uh, uh, remarks, which were indeed very well suited to the uh, beginning of our discussion. Uh, Professor Lever Levinson, I'll turn it over to you with, uh, with uh, the sense that you may disagree with some of those things. Yes, um, I too want to express my uh, very warm gratitude to the Federal Society. Um, um, I've been on programs before and um, usually in a dissenting role, and that certainly may be the case today. Um, I disagree very strongly with what Ms. Neely very capably presented. Uh, let me begin simply with a conversation that I had many years ago with Steve Calabrese, who's an old friend, uh, where I suggested that there was something a little bit odd in having James Madison as the iconic figure uh, of the Federalist Society, um, especially with regard to the Senate, because Ms. Neely, in her introduction, gave an extraordinarily partial view of what Madison said in Federalist 62. It's true he defended the Senate, and actually I would not abolish the Senate. I think that this country is way too large to be governed by a singular uh, house. Indeed, I think Texas is too large to be governed by a singular house. Um, I don't think that's the case with Nebraska and those states that are smaller, say, than New Zealand, which does just fine with the unicameral legislature. And I commend Nebraska for getting rid of its Senate. But the larger you get, there's more to be said for having a second house. That's not a debate. Uh, but if one goes back to Federal 62, one discovers that Madison, after praising having a Senate and after praising selection by the legislature, so we can talk more about that, um, I would not repeal the 17th Amendment, but I don't regard it as a crazy idea. Um, Madison went on to say that equal membership in the Senate is a lesser evil. So I want to focus on both of those words. First of all, evil. Um, that's not a word that he threw around lightly. It violated any principle of democracy or, for that matter, Republican government. Uh, I agree that the framers were not little d Democrats in any strong sense, with some exceptions. But with regard to the Senate, um, Madison was a raving little d Democrat. He was tempted to walk out of the convention, but decided not to. Um, and instead submit to the extortion of Delaware, um, demanding equal representation, uh, because the greater evil would have been no constitution at all. So morally or theoretically, the principle of equal representation in the Senate for Madison was the equivalent of those people who oppose slavery and there were a number of anti-slavery people in Philadelphia who swallowed hard and said the only way to get a constitution is to make compromises with slave owners. And they did that, three-fifths clause, um, et cetera. And we got a constitution. You can you know, argue whether the compromises were worth it or not. But it is simply foolish to deny that the iconic figure of the Federalist Society believed that equal representation in the Senate was an evil, though it was a price worth paying given the alternative, which would have been two or three separate countries along the Eastern coast that almost inevitably would have gotten into war with one another and would have replicated the worst part of the European experience. Um, I find it ironic that Republicans or conservatives defend the Senate in terms of these poor creatures in small states who need extra voting power, because that's an affirmative action program. The U.S. Senate, the modern U.S. Senate, I would argue, has almost literally nothing to do with 
with defending the values of federalism, that is decentralized government uh, that Ms. Neely also spoke to and which we could have an entirely separate conversation about, that is how much decision making should take place at the local level and how much at the national level. The U.S. Senate has almost nothing to do with that debate except on those instances where their constituents believe very strongly in return of power to the states. And at that point, the senators from Texas or the senators from Idaho might be decentralizers or anti-federalists in the sense of devolving power, because that's what the constituents want. Um, No senator could care less about what members of state legislatures want since the 17th Amendment. And I say, I think reasonable people could have an argument as to whether the 17th Amendment was a good idea or not. But once we have the 17th Amendment, what the principle of equal representation does is to serve as this gigantic affirmative action program for people who happen to live in Idaho, Montana, et cetera. And you know, I tend to support affirmative action programs as they're commonly defined. But I dare say that nobody I know who supports affirmative action programs would suggest that his or her favorite group get, let us say, 60 votes while other people have only one vote. Um, I'm thinking right now of Wyoming compared to California. It's not quite so dramatic with Vermont and Texas. I much prefer Vermont's two senators to Texas's two senators, given my own politics. But I think it's indefensible that Bernie Sanders and uh, Patrick Leahy have the same voting power in the Senate as John Cornyn and Ted Cruz, whatever my views about Senators Cruz and Cornyn happen to be. So if you're going to defend the idea that these poor creatures who live in small states deserve tons of extra voting power, then let's talk about other affirmative action controversies and how much additional weight on the thumb and not merely tie-breaking rules in admitting people to colleges or hiring people uh, to universities and the like, but actually voting power, which really does count. The other side of this coin, ironically or not, is that if one really deeply cares about states because of the view um, that states represent genuine political entities who ought not be overborne by what opponents of Madison's constitution correctly called a consolidated government, then I think that one of the things another panel, or perhaps we should be talking about, is secession. Because I think that many of the arguments for equal voting power depend on an issue of state integrity, what Anthony Kennedy liked to call state dignity. That really does raise profound questions. My own view, for example, is that if Donald Trump wins re-election through the indefensible electoral college while losing the popular vote by, say, five or 10 million votes, and if the U.S. Senate remains Republican um, by, say, one vote with a minority of the national vote, um, uh, and under what for me would be the worst case scenario that the House unpredictably returns Republican because of gerrymandering in my home state of North Carolina or elsewhere, then I would think that John Hughes' home state of California, which I identify increasingly as part of Pacifica, might think quite seriously about why stay around in the union. Um, And if the argument is, you know, Lincolnian, we're all part of one union, we're all in this together, we accept the notion that we're all equal, we think that the Supreme Court was more correct than not, 
in saying that the basic principle of American democracy is one person, one vote, then, you know, I think there's a lot to those arguments. But I think the acceptance of those arguments suggests that it really is indefensible, that Madison was right in 1788, that this U.S. Senate with equal representation is an evil. Uh, one very final point, and I'll stop. The distributive consequences are very profound. It's not merely that residents of small states get far, far more representation than they're entitled to. But as we learned in this presidential season, residents of small states can be wildly atypical. Um, Iowa and New Hampshire notably are remarkably white. Um, they're rural. Bernie Sanders, until he decided to run for president, had an excellent voting record from the NRA's perspective on guns, not surprisingly, because Vermont is a small rural state where lots of people quite reasonably want to have guns for a variety of purposes. And Sanders, as a proper representative, was mirroring the views of his constituents. Mike Bloomberg, from a very different state, a very different social reality, has a different view of guns, as is true of most of John Hughes' compatriots um, in California. Um, so the the imbalance in the Senate, the fact that the it turns out that the coal-producing states include Montana, Wyoming, West Virginia, uh, the leading fracking state is North Dakota. There are fine people in all of these states. We can certainly have a reasonable debate on coal and its uh, value to modern American society. But the fact is that the coal producing states have a wildly disproportionate power in the United States. The corn producing states have a wildly disproportionate power. And this leads to all sorts of subsidies that I would hope that many of the members of the Federalist Society would have some doubts about. Um, and so it, it seems to me that, you know, I have no objection to having the Senate. Um, there is value to a second house. I really do think in the 21st century that James Madison was absolutely correct. And in fact, he's more correct even now than he was in 1788, because at then, at that point, Vermont, I'm sorry, Virginia was a mere 17 times the population of Delaware, which sent Madison into rage. Whereas today, the disproportions are way, way beyond 17 to 1. Very good. Thank you, Professor Levinson. Uh, John Yu, what do you have to say? <laughs> That's great, Sandy. Always uh, provocative. And I just want to say that if California were to leave the union, it would be a great example of what we call Pareto efficiency because everybody in California would be happy and everybody in the rest of the country would be happy to see us go. But seriously, I, I wanna thank uh, the Federal Society for inviting me. It's been, uh, I have to say, I went to my first Federal Society convention as a student in uh, 1991. And so this is uh, coming up on my, uh, gosh, 20th Federal Society convention. And this has got to be the most unusual one, even more so than the uh, great uh, winter storm that was in 1993, which I remember almost shut down the symposium. And the great, uh, I think there was another one during a hurricane once in Washington. So uh, I'm glad to see that the federal side is pushing forward, even in the face of a corona, a biological warfare by a virus, to go ahead and still have the convention. And I really thank the uh, students at the University of Michigan, although I'm sorry I'm going to miss my chance to probably one and only chance ever to uh, sit in the University of Michigan football stadium, because I'm sure the Cal football team will never make an appearance in that stadium. And I'd like to thank my uh, co-panelists, of course, uh, Judge Kethledge, who, yeah, he, he does remind us of how old we are by uh, referring to the time we were both 
young Senate staffers uh, back in the day. And uh, it was really great to work with him then. It's great to see him as a distinguished appellate judge now. And uh, great to see uh, Amanda, who have been on several panels with now, uh, representing the Senate. And I have to say, uh, Sandy and Lynn, it's a great pleasure because uh, when I was a uh, young scholar, and I wrote one of my earliest pieces on the role of the Senate and judicial review, and that both of their works were uh, you know, very, very provocative for then uh, during the beginning of the federalism revolution on the Supreme Court. And I learned a lot from them and I'm looking forward to exchanging, continuing to exchange views with them uh, now. So I just have uh, a few points uh, to add uh, to Amanda's and then maybe respond a little bit to Sandy. Um, I think uh, Sandy's point is about whether, is about how many votes states should get. But I don't see him seriously criticizing the idea of having an upper house of the legislature that does not represent the, the majority. And so I think those are things that's important to distinguish. I think the framers uh, were wise to design a second house. In the original version of the Constitution, of course, they wanted to have a Senate that was elected by the House so that the Senate still would have been uh, directly a majority, not directly, but indirectly majoritarian. And of course, the, the uh, great compromise between the large and the small states uh, brought the Senate into being as the price of having the Constitution. Uh, it's important to remember that the founders were uh, suspicious of democracy. Uh, Sandy's right to invoke James Madison. Uh, James Madison, of course, was against having uh, a Senate. In fact, if you recall, he wanted to have a council of revision that would have brought together uh, aspects of the national government to continuously exercise not just judicial review, but policy review over all of the acts of the state legislatures. Um, on the other hand, Madison and the other leaders at the Constitutional Convention and in the ratification debates had come together because they thought that democracy had gone too far in the states. You might recall James Madison wrote this uh, memo right before the Constitutional Convention called the vices of the system. And in that memo, I think he didn't call it a memo, but you know, James Madison would have been an inveterate memo writer today. We would have been sick of getting all his emails today. Uh, he wrote an analysis of what had gone wrong during the critical period between the revolution and the Constitution, the diagnosis was excessive democracy. Uh, the democracies that existed in the state constitutions looked very much like what uh, Amanda worries about. It would, uh, uh, governments with uh, no upper house, really, other than one controlled by the legislature, one with a weakened executive, again, controlled by the legislature. Things that look much more like parliamentary democracies as we see them in Western Europe. And so it's not uh, just the Senate, but a lot of the features of the Constitution that they wrote have this uh, anti-democratic features feature, or at least have the goal of trying to channel and limit democracy. So, so if we have objections to the Senate, we also ought to have objections just to having uh, right uh, House seats allocated by states. We ought to have objections to the judiciary and judicial review and the electoral college. And, and so on. And in, in fact, we should we would have uh, we would disagree with the idea of having uh, power divided by a federal and state government all and wonder why, why. Why don't we have a system more like France or Japan, where all power just flows from a singular national government? And then what we really have is just decentralized administrative units rather than semi sovereign states. And so one question is, is it really worth undoing? All that you could talk, I think Sandy raised a question of uh, consequences. And it's hard to say what the consequences would have been if we hadn't had a Senate or we hadn't had a Senate where, Senate where every state had two seats. Uh, the best you can do, I think, is compare and look at what happened to other countries that have adopted much more democratic or majoritarian systems or ones that without a kind of Senate. The best ones you can look at might be Western Europe or Japan, you look at countries like you, the uh, United Kingdom, uh, France, Germany, Italy, countries which are much more democratic in their design than ours and could ask in the last hundred years or so, have their outcomes consistently been uh, better? I mean, the Senate plays, uh, regardless of whether it's states that are there or some other non-democratic means of selection, the Senate does have the effect of slowing down the ability of the United States to adopt public policies. Uh, some might say that adds to greater deliberation, uh, 
Other people might say it also allows entrenched uh, interest in the status quo to have a, uh, to stay in effect that there's a bias against change. But is rapid change so good when you look at what happened over the last hundred years in Western Europe? It may uh, prevent, for example, quick action uh, in the middle of that uh, to, for public policy problems, but also might prevent the adoption of wild schemes and bad ideas. Uh, you might say that's what happened in uh, England in the last 50, 60 years where there's swings between nationalization, privatization, free markets, back and forth, back and forth. Is it really, uh, does that lead to better public policy? You could say our constitution is almost a risk averse uh, decision-making system and that the Senate is a crucial part of that. And then that brings me to uh, my second point, uh, which is that the Senate also performs a lot of functions that aren't really about representing the states. And I agree with Sandy that it, if I were to look at it today, I wouldn't say based on voting patterns that the Senate really represents the institutional interests of the states. They really represent sort of what the constituents in those states happen to want now. And as a, so as a result, magnify the current everyday and political interests of people who happen to live in different geographic locations uh, rather than any kind of institutional protection uh, of the states. Uh, that may be true. You don't really see, as far as I can tell, you don't see uh, voting patterns where small states gang up on the bigger states and uh, vote as a unit. You, I think you probably see that the states just vote according to the parties, the partisan control of the state governments, and that you are starting to see groupings now where the the, the states on the coast tend to vote together, and maybe the states in the middle tend to vote, or the country tend to vote together. But the Senate also plays uh, an important role uh, in other areas, and this is where the Senate's original design before the Great Compromise is still part of the Constitution, the idea that the Senate is a kind of council of state. Uh, and so you have the Senate playing uh, that role in it's not not a, really as the second house of the legislature, but as the advice and consent function for judges, advice and consent function for cabinet officers, uh, ratifying treaties, uh, as we just saw for the third time in history, conducting impeachment trials, uh, being a body that <clears throat> has a veto over letting constitutional amendments get to the country. Uh, and that's another important function that I think we should not Forget uh, George Washington. I think when he was when Thomas Jefferson came back uh, from being ambassador to France, you know, he'd missed being he missed the framing period actually uh, because of uh, because of his diplomatic posting. And he asked, I believe, George Washington, "What what's the point of the Senate?" And uh, Washington was drinking a cup of uh, tea at the time, and he poured a little bit into the saucer, and he said, "That's the job of the Senate." It takes the hot tea of <clears throat> democracy, and he called it democracy, it takes a hot tea and allows it to cool a little bit before we drink it. And I think the Senate plays that role in many areas throughout our government. It's, a, it's not a mistake, I think, that the Senate is involved in every major decision that our government makes uh, in distinction to the House, which does not participate in the executive functions of the Senate, uh, that it's there to slow down, cool things, hopefully lead to more deliberation and compromise. So just the <clears throat> last question I think is, I, I think it's a very uh, interesting question that Sandy raises about if you, uh, and I don't, I don't, I took him to say that he doesn't really dispute the idea of having a second house at all, which is non-democratic. Then the interesting question I take, which I agree with him is, if we were to sit down and think about now, should we make it uh, two seats for every Senate? Should we think about other ways of making the Senate uh, more proportional, uh, by, but does it have to be by population? Uh, there are, I, I mean, I wouldn't favor going this route, but there are other countries I think that have upper houses where uh, distinguished citizens, I think this is what they do in Italy. Uh, I think like if you're a distinguished writer, you can be made a Senator for life in Italy. I, I gotta say Italy is not the government I'd be copying right now for many, many reasons. But, you know, if you're going to open it up, you could say, well, does it have to be states? Could you have different interests represented in a second house, which is similar to what uh, constitutions in new countries have? Or uh, so if you want, I, I tend to think these wouldn't be great ideas, but I think it's an interesting question to pursue in addition to should each state itself have two votes. And let me end with this. Um, one thing we should be cautious of, though, is that 
our instinct to reopen that debate and this why voting disparities that Sandy mentions are right, the products of sociological change. And we, I gotta ask whether it makes sense to change the constitution based on where democratic demographic patterns happen to be right now. So of course, right now we have people concentrating in the cities. Uh, those cities tend to be on the coasts or in the middle of the, in the, along the Mississippi River, for example, or in Texas. Uh, and so that produces that disparity. That may not be the way things are 20 or 30 years from now. After this uh, coronavirus, maybe people won't want to live in crowded cities much longer. Might, you might see a remigration out to farming. We're all going to start participating on Google Meets or I'm teaching class on Zoom. I have no idea where any of my students are, which is probably for their own good. And they don't have to look at me anymore, which is probably for their own good. Might, if we have a more decentralized economy, we might have more de decentralized social power. Would have made sense to have rejiggered our constitution because for, at one time in our history, we had urbanization and concentration of population in some cities. Maybe it makes sense to leave the constitution as it is because once you start to remove some of the sticks that hold the house together, you're, we can't tell the consequences of what other structures it might undermine. So thank you again, uh, Judge, and thank you uh, to the Federal Society and my fellow panelists for this uh, uh, this, uh, this really innovative and new way to have a conference. I hope uh, I hope it all uh, works out and I look forward to everyone else's comments. I'm gonna try to, yes, I'm gonna mute myself now, which is something a lot of my colleagues have always wished I would, that button to be pressed. All right, uh, thank you, John, for those very thoughtful remarks. Uh, let's hear from Professor Baker. Well, thank you, Judge, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I echo the thanks of my panelists uh, with regard to the Federalist Society and their heroic efforts uh, to proceed notwithstanding uh, current conditions. Um, I'm delighted to get to meet Amanda, so to say. Um, Sandy's a dear friend, and uh, it's always entertaining to me when we go all the way to Michigan, or in this case not, uh, to be on the same panel. Um, Sandy and our colleagues at Texas, and I have to say Sandy, uh, particularly uh, when he disagrees with colleagues, is unusually open-minded and warm and generous. And it's been a great treat for me to have a colleague uh, at Texas. Um, and, and John is, is one of the uh, pillars of, of, of the organization and, and a very important figure. Um, I do want to pick up uh, where John left off. He was kind enough to mention, uh, as if to underscore the age difference between him and me, that when he was starting out, he, I'm teasing you, John, that when he was starting out, uh, he was very interested to read uh, work that Sandy and I had both already done on the Senate. And to give you a sense of where I'm headed, that very first article I published about this back in 1997 was titled, The Senate Colon, An Institution Whose Time Has Gone, question mark. And um, I'm going to be siding largely with Sandy. I don't know if I would term the Senate evil. Um, I would term it deeply problematic today. And indeed problematic um, while sharing many of the uh, policy goals that um, Amanda put forward. Um, I do think uh, it's very important uh, to have some protection for minority viewpoints. A lot of my scholarship has been devoted to um, uh, being pro uh, state sovereignty. I teach state and local government law. I'm a big fan of, of state government. Yet somehow she and I end up in different places with regard to the Senate, um, I might be cynical and say she's employed by the Senate, and I am not, but uh, I, won't, I won't go there despite being a, a public choice kind of person. So um, from the very beginning of our constitutional democracy, uh, we are all aware that the Senate has held an exalted place. My preceding panelists have noted uh, Article 5, for example, the apportionment of representation in the Senate uh, is the only provision uh, among our current uh, constitution's dictates that cannot be amended pursuant to the ordinary procedures of Article 5. We've heard from Sandy and Amanda and John bits and pieces of 
why this was such an important part of getting the country off the ground, so to speak, and I'm not here to dispute any of that. But what I do want to talk about today uh, is the fact that there are two particular harms, some of which Sandy hinted at, that today derive uh, from the fact that the existing allocation of representation in the Senate provides small population states what, what we all understand to be disproportionate power relative uh, to their populations. This creates two harms from my view. Uh, the first is that the Senate systematically and unjustifiably redistributes wealth from large population states to small population states. Sandy was intimating at this with some of his examples of subsidies. And I would go farther and say we could expect the redistribution to, to extend. It takes the form, perhaps, of some subsidies, but that we would expect to see redistribution on that basis uh, in a wide host of areas. Secondly, I want to talk about the fact that the Senate, uh, again, systematically and to my mind unjustifiably, affords large population states disproportionately little power relative uh, to their shares of the nation's population to block federal homogenizing legislation of the sort that I think Amanda and I might actually agree on. If we're both concerned to protect minority rights, that is to say minority viewpoints that minority states might have, the Senate will help with this in some of the ways that John discussed, but at the same time, the, the large population states will be at a disadvantage relative to the small population states in protecting their own minority viewpoints in this way. So let me uh, go into some detail now about each of those. The redistribution of wealth from large population uh, states to small ones uh, is in part, I would add, not entirely the fault of the Senate structure of representation. Uh, that's what our topic is, so I will focus on that. But I have elsewhere discussed and have published significantly on this as well, that a lot of the problem is also what the U.S. Supreme Court has done since the founding in terms of taking provisions of the Constitution, such as the spending power, and making essentially meaningless or non-justiciable notions like general welfare, um, which uh, could have been providing constraints. We might similarly think of some of the uh, other uh, Article I uh, limitations that, again, might have helped with some of this through, uh, through further uh, underscoring state sovereignty. But we are where we are, and the Supreme Court has played the role that it has, and we're here to discuss the Senate. So that disproportionate power that the Senate gives small population states, it's not going to affect the total dollar amount of what I will call pork barrel spending. Um, we can just call it spending. I'll call it pork barrel spending that's enacted. But it is absolutely going to affect the distribution of that spending. And this was in part Sandy's point. And so if the Senate alone uh, could enact legislation, we would expect the total dollar amount uh, that each state would receive over time to be roughly equal. And this would mean, for example, that if $1 billion uh, of, of special legislation or other benefits from the federal government uh, were uh, provided uh, to the states that each resident of California, uh, John State, would receive $34, while each resident of Wyoming would receive an excess of $2,200. That's our 65 times as much uh, benefit, that ratio that Sandy mentioned earlier. By contrast, of course, if the House alone uh, were engaged in this, we would expect to see substantially equal uh, per capita uh, benefits uh, over time. Now, of course, our current system uh, has both the House and the Senate. Neither body alone is able to uh, adopt uh, uh, legislation of, of this or any other sort. And so it's then important to appreciate, well, what is the balancing effect of these two different houses apportioned uh, in their representative uh, capacities in very different ways? And uh, 
sometimes in, in sort of elementary school civics, one is taught that, oh, this is a very nice balance. The large population states and the small population states are somehow made equal. Uh, through this uh, fact of the two houses as they balance each other. And in fact, uh, in that very early publication I mentioned long ago, um, I deployed uh, with a co-author formal game theory. We calculated the Shapley-Schubick indices um, of the various, um, of the various uh, states given the populations at the time. And here's the math of how the balancing actually works out. So let's look at California and Rhode Island. Uh, Amanda mentioned Rhode Island, and, and California has been mentioned amply. So the population ratio is 32 to 1 between California and Rhode Island. The power in the House, in terms of representation, um, is 33 and a half to 1, very similar, as we would, in fact, expect. Power in the Senate, we understand that. That's one to one. And then power in Congress turns out to be five and a half to one. And so when we combine, theoretically, the power in the House and the Senate, we don't get even a midpoint between those two bodies. What we get is five and a half, which looks a whole lot closer to one than it does uh, to 32. And so... Um, we went on in that initial research, and we looked to see what one might find empirically. Sandy's given us some sort of common conceptions, common understandings, anecdotal data of where are subsidies taking place. We looked systematically with the help of, of statistics compiled by both the federal government and the Kennedy School, and we looked at something called the balance of payments that individual states have with the federal government. And it turns out that the 10 largest states are minus $560 per person. So John and those of us who live in, in large population states, we're coming out minus $560 or so with the federal government. Meanwhile, the 10 smallest states um, at the time were coming up net $543. And so this was just some empirical data to be sure that this wasn't just um, a, a, a theory that wasn't actually matched in, in uh, reality. Now, as is always the case with empirical data, one can quibble around the edges. Um, but in any event, that first concern is that the Senate plays a role, but it's a redistributive role. And we might think, well, Maybe poverty explains this, right? There are redistribution, um, there are forms of redistribution we might favor. Uh, maybe this is all about poverty programs and maybe that can explain it. And in fact, the 10 largest states at the time had um, higher poverty rates on average than the 10 smallest states. So the direction uh, of redistribution is in precisely the wrong direction if that were an explanation. Now, let me turn to my second point, which has to do with homogenizing legislation, because I think Amanda and I, and, and maybe even Sandy and John, we all share a concern that um, uh, having the federal government just generally telling everyone what to do in areas not of, of things that are unconstitutional, they're unconstitutional, states shouldn't be doing them, but that outside of that diversity among the states, having states and localities fulfill the preferences of their constituents in areas of reasonable disagreement uh, would be preferable. And um, let's take as an example here um, the fact that right now 20 states uh, do not have the death penalty available as a matter of state policy. 30 states do. So in the absence uh, of a federal government, the 30 states that do have the death penalty, if they didn't like the fact that the other 20 states uh, prohibit the death penalty, they would have very few ways and have limited ways to compete for residents uh, with regard to um, what Tibu told us is the migration of people from state to state. 
So those states would be free to offer their own package of laws, uh, which would include the death penalty and the pro-death penalty state, um, along with their taxes and whatever other services they were providing their citizens. Um, they could make some adjustments to their own package. But now we bring Congress into the picture, and Congress is now able to give the 30 states that favor the death penalty uh, an additional option, which I will term anti-competitive. I will term it uh, consistent, I think, with Amanda's concern for minority viewpoints as potentially coercive of the minority viewpoints. This might take the form of conditional spending legislation. Um, it might simply take the form of a federal law prohibiting, prohibiting um, uh, states from not having the death penalty. And so I'm going to simply term this federal homogenizing uh, legislation, which is going to uh, reduce the diversity uh, in the state and uh, would therefore arguably be uh, disfavored. Now, at this point, John or Amanda might say, but isn't one of the roles of the Senate that it, in fact, makes it more difficult uh, for Congress uh, to pass laws? And so to the extent you're concerned about this, isn't the Senate actually uh, to be favored? And my response here would be, well, the problem with that is that we're going to see certain homogenizing legislation able to be stopped more readily than others. And so, for example, the large population states will have relatively little ability to block, disproportionately little ability to block that federal homogenizing legislation. Uh, meanwhile, the small population states will have relatively more ability uh, in that particular regard. And so, for example, uh, the representatives of the nine largest states uh, represent fully 50% of the nation's population. Those nine states, if they did band together, would uh, not be able to block federal homogenizing legislation that they thought was unattractive. Meanwhile, senators from the 26 smallest states which represent only 18% of the nation's population, would have a vastly uh, easier time blocking uh, that legislation. So what can we do about this? Um, and I think it's fair to say, well, as, as theoretical improvements, I personally might want uh, the states, in fact, to be represented proportionally in the Senate. And so I'll disagree with both John and Sandy on this. I'd be fine to have two bodies, each of which were proportionally represented, wouldn't have to be the same size. I would also want, though, for one of those bodies, um, let's call it the Senate, uh, to also have a supermajority rule. Um, we like supermajority rules in certain parts of the Constitution. We've already mentioned impeachment, overriding presidential vetoes. All of those are two-thirds rules. Um, and so I would offer a, a combination of those uh, as a possible uh, improvement on the current regime. Now, of course, the fact is we will never see my personal utopia. Article 5 uh, has already been mentioned, requires the consent of a small population state in order to have its allocation of representation altered. I think it's fair to assume that no small population state is going to uh, be excited uh, or interested uh, to agree to any reduction in its power uh, within the Senate. And so my last plea, uh, in, a, in a sense where I began, is that I think in the interim, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, could help with some of this problem by returning uh, to a reading of, for example, the federal spending power that would provide more meaningful uh, constraints through, for example, the general welfare language and the constitutional text. I'm in favor of, of the Tenth Amendment uh, doing more work for us than has come to do. I'm in favor of some of the Article I enumerated powers being read, um, like the commerce power, in a way that uh, is stricter rather than more, um, more permissive. So 
that's what I can offer in the meantime, uh, and I look forward to hearing everyone else's thoughts. Thank you. Uh, very good. Those really were uh, exceptionally thoughtful comments by everyone. And Professor Baker, I thought your your comments at the end. I I wasn't sure if I was uh, listening to uh, Richard Epstein, perhaps uh, there. <laughs> you actually you actually uh, kind of took a line of questioning that I was going to ask about um, uh, whether some of these criticisms uh, of the Senate and its effect on uh, uh, people in larger states, the redistribution of, of wealth or uh, you know, government uh, benefits towards those states, whether that is a, a result uh, of the federal government becoming too big. Uh, obviously, you have the expansion of the Commerce Clause Authority in 1937, which then allows the spending power to be used in a commensurately broad way to homogenize uh, uh, policy nationwide. Do you think, uh, is, is there anything short, uh, Professor Baker, and for the rest of the panel, is there anything short of the Supreme Court kind of, you know, upsetting that, uh, that body of law that, that we had come out during the late 30s, uh, revisiting that, uh, is there anything other than Supreme Court action that might address some of the problems you mentioned regarding homogenization of policy and too many benefits going to people in small states? Well, Judge, um, I personally am not sure that there is uh, because so uh, much of this um, uh, at this point uh, is, is really up for Congress uh, to decide and the Supreme Court is not providing, has not been providing the constraints. I guess um, I, I would offer a friendly amendment to your question. Um, upsetting the apple cart of precedent, uh, in some of these areas we actually haven't had that much. So in terms of spending power cases, um, we have the Affordable Care Act, uh, some of those decisions, uh, or at least one of them, is is talks a little bit in a way that um, is perhaps helpful in terms of constraining the spending power. Um, before that, there was the Guillen, Pierce County against Guillen decision, which virtually no one paid any attention to except perhaps me. I wrote an amicus brief in that case and was hoping the Supreme Court then would use it as a vehicle to uh, provide some constraint um, on the spending power where I think we do have less case law and therefore there'd be less of an apple cart to be overturned. I'm sad to say that the Supreme Court unanimously disagreed uh, with my, my amicus brief uh, on that. Uh, they were very, uh, they were fine with that particular uh, deployment of, of indeed what they termed to be simply the commerce power. They didn't even reach the spending power question. So um, I would actually push this um, for the court. I think the court is our last hope. And I would, I would push in the direction of more attention being paid to the spending power because I think there's, there's less law there that would need to be, I will call it fine judge, not necessarily overturned. Very good. Anybody else on that subject? Uh, can we use the, uh, the, the spending clause? Can we, can we change? Uh, or is there anything that we can do outside of Supreme Court uh, interpretation to address the, the two problems that Professor Baker talked about. One answer to that is simply try to persuade people that the problems that Lynn has identified are real and should be addressed, that, again, there's a paradox, whether it's liberals or conservatives, who call on the Supreme Court to save us from ourselves. Uh, there's no reason to think the Supreme Court can play that role. Um, it has not throughout history, except 
um, in very peculiar periods of lag and regime uh, transformations and the like. Um, I think the complaint is that for better, and I would admit for worse on occasion, consolidationists have by and large won the political debate um, to the degree that we don't have the cogent discussion that we ought to be having about what things should be carried on at the local level and what the national level. Um, among the participants on this panel, I'm quite confident that I am the one most opposed to constitutionalizing federalism. On the other hand, I always tell my students immediately, I strongly believe in decentralization in you know, what Europeans call subsidiarity. Um, that is a political decision. There is no doubt that many, many issues are better uh, handled at the local level, better administered at the local level. But constitutionalizing this, I think, leads primarily to incoherence and mischief, in part, really frank, lawyers and judges are not well trained in making the decisions as to what sorts of issues ought to be handled at the local level and why, and at what point you need national level decision making. You know, the whole debate about the virus is illustrative. Uh, the Trump administration, until literally yesterday, was pretending that this was an issue to be handled by local governors, local departments of public health, that the national government had almost no role to play. Uh, that's insane. Um, there are many other issues, though, where I would happily agree with my conservative friends uh, that that Nash, a single national policy doesn't make much sense. But these are political arguments that we can and ought to have courteously and with reference to relevant data. And quite frankly, I just don't think that what we do in law schools is to prepare people to engage in really cogent analysis of most of these. You know, maybe if you take a law degree as well as a degree from the LBJ school or the Hubert Humphrey school or the John Kennedy School, or the George Bush School, then maybe yes. But you know, there are many things I think law schools do well, but really grappling with the policy and political decisions as to who ought to be making decisions about public health, et cetera, I think we do a terrible job, quite frankly. John, you had your hand up earlier. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think it's important to remember, though, that the Constitution does create a system of enumerated federal powers and uh, general state police powers. We're getting reminded of that right now uh, in the coronavirus uh, epidemic, where we uh, have really the frontline responsibilities are in the hands of the states, and we're going to see difference, differences in performances by different state governments, and the federal government is there to uh, provide spending, uh, provide equipment, uh, you know, accelerate uh, deployment of uh, uh, approvals of vaccines, perhaps, or cure, I mean, cures, one hopes. But that really it's the states that are responsible with the police power to uh, implement things like quarantines, shutting down institutions, and so on. And I think that uh, that's what the Constitution calls for. It's a difficult problem, uh, but I don't think that means that it's uh, purely political. Uh, because like the Senate is part of the original uh, design. And I, I have to say, I think in terms of what the court's done is that the court has only made, uh, despite what a, a lot of critics say, I think the court has made only sort of small steps in trying to restore uh, federalism. I mean, look, most of the cases are really about the sovereign immunity of states, which I think in the grand scheme of things in terms of federal and state policies, it really is a blip. And uh, yes, Lopez and uh, Morrison remind us that there are limits on the Commerce Clause, but has, the, has any really serious national legislation uh, 
uh, been delayed by the Supreme Court because of federalism concerns. I mean, even Obamacare, yes, the court struck down some of it, but for the most part, it went forward despite constitutional uh, concerns about the federalism aspects of it. So I, I think that there's a lot to do if the courts really wanted to restore some balance between the federal and state governments that would be uh, consistent with what the framers originally designed. That doesn't tell us the, which I think I, I read Sandy and Linda be raising is really what, these are hard doctrinal questions. And it's just, but that doesn't mean because the doctrinal questions are hard that we shouldn't try to you know, live up to the principles that are written to the constitution. Uh, I don't think that, you know, consider my colleague, Jesse Tripper once argued, he thought it was so hard that meant federalism itself was a political question. I actually kind of read Sandy and sometimes Linda be coming closer to that saying, it's, these are such hard doctrinal questions. They're so beyond the ability of judges to really fashion a line between what's federal and what's state that we should just let the Senate take care of it. Um, but because we've just been talking about in the panel, how the Senate doesn't really represent state interests as institutions or represents federalism because they're so uh, consumed with just representing the interests of their constituents that uh, right, the, the Senate may not be a reliable final backstop uh, for federalism. It, it does go to Lynn's point because the, um, the, the large amounts of money that are available to the federal government because of the income tax amendment, uh, constituents within states are maybe only too happy to give up state institutional interests in order to have access to federal funding. And so you still need the courts, I think, there to draw some kind of line, no matter how difficult it is to figure out what it is. Sandy, you had your hand up. Did you want to make a rebuttal? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that where John and I agree, I, ironically or not, is that the Supreme Court decisions on federalism, as much as, quite frankly, they irritate me, and I've invited Lynn, on a, when I used to teach first-year con law, I would invite Lynn to come in to talk about them because it, I thought it was important for students to hear somebody who actually, you know, approved of them. But I agree with John. I agree with Ernie Young, whom I suspect might have taught Amanda at Duke, that they're just this side of much ado about nothing or much ado about very little. I agree that the sovereign immunity cases are of interest primarily to law professors. They raise very interesting theoretical questions, but they don't get to the core of the issue that John is raising. Same thing is true of the anti-commandeering cases, which irritate me a great deal, but in fact um, are not substantively all that important. Um, but you know, I, I do believe that ultimately this is a political debate, and I'm I'm just kind of amazed that you know that that people who take the the idea of devolution seriously would believe that that debate can be won by going off to judges rather than trying to engage in the full-scale public debate. Um, and in fact, you know, for better or worse, um, the what I'll call the devolutionists won big victories under the Reagan administration and the Bush administration and the Trump administration, and then lost, uh, you know, the pendulum swung along the other way with, in the Obama administration. But it's not that these debates are merely academic debates. What I really do find mystifying is why anybody would have faith in the judiciary as the solution. James Madison, uh, famous or infamous for his criticism of parchment barriers. He used parchment barriers the very first time in Federalist 48, where he said that trying to protect federalism by putting some clause in the Constitution would be very likely to be a parchment barrier. 
um, that you know ultimately one would have to look to the structure of government, including having a Senate. We all agree that there is value to having a second house. The disagreement is how it ought to be organized. I think some of John's ideas, whether or not he was tossing them out fully seriously or only for provocation, are worth serious discussion, that the Senate ought to be interestingly different from the House. And God knows it's interestingly different when Wyoming has equal uh, representation to California, I would eliminate that interesting difference tomorrow. But there are other interesting differences we could talk about. Some of them have to do with the length of the term. Um, the idea of appointing ex officio members is a very serious issue. Uh, Larry Sabato from Virginia wrote a very interesting book about a decade ago in which he suggested, for example, that former presidents, former vice presidents, former heads of the Joint Chiefs, former heads of the Fed, uh, retired members of the Supreme Court, all ought to be ex officio members of the Senate. Uh, this is very, very much worth debating. We could even have some role for great private leaders, though there would be much more debate about um, whom exactly we would wish to pick for that, the president of this university or that university, et cetera. But all of these are discussions that ought to be on the table. As far as I'm concerned, my animus is principally against equal representation in the Senate, um, because I really do find that ultimately indefensible unless one does adopt a you know roaringly robust theory of affirmative action exclusively for the residents of small states. Uh, let me just offer one data point and also take the opportunity to flack a book that my wife and I wrote ostensibly <laughs> for teenagers, but really for everybody, including the grandparents, et cetera, the teenagers, we talk about the USA Patriot Act and the fact that because of Pat Leahy, you know, Senator whom ordinarily I would revere, et cetera, Leahy represents a state that in 2001 had a population that was 0.0045 of the entire United States. However, he was able to write into the Patriot Act the sta a standard funding formula so that every state in the union, regardless of its population, got 0.75, at least 0.75 of the revenues, which meant that Wyoming got $61 per person and California got $14 a person. Now, if your concern is about protecting the United States from terrorism, or if your concern is protecting the United States for, from the pandemic, I don't have anything against the people in Wyoming or Vermont, but I do think it is insane literally, to give them this disproportionate share of federal funds as a result of their disproportionate share of power in the Senate. Um, you know, there are other things we can talk about. If, um, you know, I don't dislike farmers. There might be good reasons for farm subsidies and for taking money from my pocket and giving it to the good folks in Iowa. But with regard to the USA Patriot Act, it really does seem to me a knockdown argument of political insanity that is generated by an indefensible constitutional structure. Okay. Um, well, uh, Sandy and some others have referred to the judiciary's role in all this, so maybe I can offer a few comments myself. Um, as I listen to the criticisms, the specific criticisms about the Senate, I find myself wondering if, if these problems have actually been quite magnified by progressive policies, as opposed to adherence to the more classical liberal design of the framers. And and I wonder then if 
if we had a strong originalist majority on the Supreme Court, might that significantly address these very problems? The, of course, the great homogenizer of national policy is the administrative state. The, administra the administrative state does most of the legislating in this country uh, because of the Supreme Court's basically abandonment of the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, the spending clause, the, 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 the federal government is able to use that power uh, as, as Professor Baker has, has very uh, ably described it, to, to, to coerce states to adopt policies they otherwise would not adopt. The, expan the wildly expansive view of the commerce clause, it's not the, uh, regulating the movement of goods as it was for the first 160 years of our history. Now it's the manufacturer and anything that affects the, the manufacturer that affects the economy. Uh, if the Supreme Court went back to a Schechter poultry uh, uh, conception of congressional regulatory power and non-delegation in that same case, uh, might that restrict congressional power in a way that lets states that lets the more new, the greater population in California, the greater population in New York, they can they can uh, uh, decide for themselves uh, much more the laws that they will have to live under, as opposed to having those uh, uh, visited upon them by the United States Senate, uh, in part. So uh, I wonder, uh, and and. While we're at it, you know, if we had a flat tax and wealthier states, which tend to be the more populous ones, uh, were not at member, you know, citizens in wealthier states were not paying disproportionately high taxes. Query whether that too might address some of this uh, concern about uh, too much, uh, uh, you know, it basically transfer payments from smaller states to bigger ones. So. Why don't we go back to originalism? Why don't we go back to uh, uh, classical liberalism? And maybe that, by shrinking the size of the federal government, would dramatically shrink these problems too. Anybody else jumps in? I, I always will. Um, Frank, I think this topic of a different panel. Um, I have much to say about originalism, and one of the things I would begin is by pointing out that the James Madison of 1787 uh, wanted a consolidated government. Um, he was a distinctly unhappy founding father with regard to his child. He wanted Congress to have a national veto over any and all state policies that were not conducive to national interest. Now, the fact is he lost. And you can say that let's not really focus on James Madison or Alexander Hamilton as the presumptive founding fathers. Let's focus on Luther Martin or some of the others. But those are debates about originalism, which I'm happy to have. Uh, but I think they really are or you know, the administrative state. Um, but they're orthogonal to the issue of if we had the constitutional convention that I'm unique on this panel in wanting, where we where debates about originalism would be literally irrelevant, because what we would be discussing is the issue that John or Lynn have put on the table. What would be or and Amanda, what would be desirable public policy in the 21st century for a country? that of 320 million people, um, which is 80 times the population of the United States in 1790. So, you know, one of my complaints about originalism is that they literally could not have imagined the world we live in, and we should design a constitution fit for the world we live in. I am happy to have all sorts of debates about whether or not we're just too large to be governed from the center. This is one of the reasons, frankly, why I think debates about peaceful secession ought to be on the table. Um, uh, 1861 was a very particular example 
of an evil secessionist movements. But you look around the world, there have been peaceful secessions, there have been violent secessions. The one thing I'm confident of is that nobody on principle either supports or opposes every single secessionist movement. Americans can't do that because we got our independence by seceding from the British Empire. Uh, So there are all sorts of things that we can and ought to discuss without having to get into the quagmire of originalist constitutional doctrine. Judge, can I jump in? Yes, yes, sorry. Um, Yeah, go ahead, John. Just I I, I have maybe a different kind of reaction to your comments in Sandy's, which was, I, I think that the it's interesting, we're talking about the Senate and the kind of change you're talking about, Judge, I would tend to agree with in the sense that the original Constitution is rather Spartan and permits a fairly large number of arrangements and outcomes. And we're living, I think, in a time where the government, uh, this New Deal revolution of 1937, was designed to regulate using the administrative state, as you mentioned, to sort of post homogenized uh, nationwide legislation and regulatory schemes, I think is growing more and more obsolete in terms of this new kind of world and economy that we have. We essentially have a, a, a governing structure for a time of huge employers like U.S. Steel and large unions uh, and large workforces where the they're still working out the industrial revolution and mass production. And now I think the our economy and society are changing very differently because of the information revolution. It's not apparent to me that the revolution of 1937 uh, should continue, that we, you know, that's the, the best system. And so I, I quite agree with you, Judge, we should rethink whether uh, we should return back to the original principles, uh, whether there's some other system, and this is more Sandy's direction, whether there are other systems that might be more appropriate to better govern in this growing, this more increasingly decentralized economy and society. I, I just wonder, the, the interesting thing is uh, the Senate is going to be a roadblock to all of that, right? Because even though the Senate represents, uh, ideally was supposed to represent the states, it really just does slow down deliberation and change. And so to the extent we do want to change the government in whatever direction, because it no longer fits the economy and society we have, the Senate's going to present prevent that. It's going to, the Senate, just because it's so hard to overcome the filibuster over it to get any legislation through the Senate, it would, if you wanted to dismantle the administrative state, for example, and return it more towards the classical liberal uh, government, or you want to go Sandy's route and have different forms of government, um, it's going to be very hard to do that through legislation the Senate, to ask the Senate to repeal aspects of government organization, to ask it to take back, I, I wish it would, but to ask it to take back more authority from the agencies is going to be extremely difficult just because of the setup, setup of the Senate and the way its interests uh, work. And so you could do it, I think, through the courts, but the courts can only get you so far. I mean, suppose the court were to have, suppose the court does take up the challenge in Gundy and tries to articulate some mm-hmm. kind of non-delegation doctrine. I still think the hard work, the nitty gritty of reorganizing the Ministry of State is still going to be up to Congress. The courts aren't going to do it for the Congress. It's really Congress. But the Senate is going to be making it very difficult to do that because it just slows down and blocks most change. Uh, I'm going to make a brief comment, and Amanda hasn't had a chance to speak in a while, so I'm going to let her speak, and then and then Sandy. Um, I think an originalist interpretation of the Constitution would would address some of these problems by uh, rendering impermissible some of the policy choices that have magnified the. Uh, deleterious effects of the Senate, as as some of the criticisms have been made, but we, addressing those need not be a debate about originalism. We could have a debate about whether we want to approach a more classically liberal policy model as opposed to a progressive policy model, um, and uh, and you know uh, there would be significant changes in these very problems if we did that. But anyway, um, Amanda, why don't, you, why don't you make your point? Uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I tend to agree with your point that moving back toward an originalist court would alleviate some of these problems. But um, 
I don't think the courts can be responsible for fixing our entire system of government. It was meant to be the weakest branch of government. Um, so I'm not sure we should be relying on them to, to save us from ourselves. Um, but to John's point, I think that um, the, the Senate is a roadblock. I don't think we were meant to be, or the Senate was, sorry, I'm not, I'm not a senator. Um, I don't think the Senate was meant to be uh, an institution that couldn't get anything done ever. I don't think that the filibuster was meant to completely limit um, Congress. Um, and we've seen changes to the filibuster over time. And actually, I'll, I'll throw it back to John, Lynn, Sandy. Um, if you have any thoughts about how we should change the filibuster, or should it be changed? It's been changed over time. It went from 67 in the early 1900s to 60 to, to end debate um, during the civil rights era. Should we reduce that number? Should we have a ratchet system that goes um, down with the number of votes over a period of time? Do you get to a point where you might be able to pass legislation? Um, I'm, I'm curious to know the other panelists' thoughts on that. I'm, I'm still sort of developing my own thoughts on that. That's a great question, Amanda. I mean, given the difficulty of amending the Constitution to change the structure of the Senate, given the difficulty or the unlikelihood of the Supreme Court overruling its, its New Deal cases, what, what changes might be made within the Senate itself to address some of these problems? Uh, I'll give uh, uh, Professor Levinson maybe the first shot and, and maybe Lynn uh, or whoever wants. I could tell I could read the body language. It, this thing works that well, at least. Uh, but Sandy, I, I know you had some thoughts and maybe you could tie them into to that question as well. First is a very quick question for John, because my own view is that one of the truly awful decisions of the late 20th century was Chada, um, which was an attempt by Congress to at least moderately rein in what they, by stipulation, thought were excesses of the administrative state. And in a stunningly formalistic decision, the Supreme Court granted that, in effect, vast new powers to Congress by declaring unconstitutional 200 laws that had included some element of um, a legislative veto. And I'm genuinely curious what he thinks of that. With regard to Amanda and the filibuster, my own view with some reluctance is that the filibuster is an institution whose time should go. But I think that the discussion of the filibuster captures the problem we should be concentrating on in this panel, that too often discussions of the filibuster assume we're talking about majority rule or minority veto. That is, should 41 senators be allowed to stop the vote of the majority? But we also have to talk about the fact that some filibusters are more minoritarian than others, so that you can get up to 41. I mean, Lynn, in her presentation, mentioned how uh, small the national percentage could be. Uh, I forget her specific data point, but it, it made the point. I'm pretty sure you can get up to 41 senators with, let us say, 25% of the population. Um, I find that indefensible. On the other hand, as Lynn mentioned, I think it was Lynn, we, we talk about this in our book, the fact that the nine states with a majority of the population have a grand total of 18 senators, they can't filibuster anything successfully if it were only the senators of those states. And so what we really have to come back to is the extent to which the Senate overall should be sensitive to the majority preferences of the country, however much the Senate as an institution should differ in interesting ways from the House. But I do think that to focus only on the filibuster and not 
talk about who's doing the filibustering is a misleading conversation. Lynn? Lynn? I, I think I, I agree with virtually everything that Sandy just said about the filibuster. Um, the problem, as I indicated in my initial remarks, um, isn't that the Senate or a supermajoritarian body makes it more difficult uh, to pass laws, but the problem is uh, that it's an asymmetrical regime right now, that the small population states um, and, and the large population states are not able to exercise that power equivalently. So I'm, I'm less attracted uh, to that particular option of, of further tinkering with the filibuster. And again, I would note that um, any structural changes that are going to diminish power of small population states, we could expect them to oppose, and there are a lot of them. So uh, I want to echo some of what John has reminded us uh, about the founding. Um, I like to tell my students that the original federal government was a nickel and dime operation, um, and, and it was intended to uh, be that way. And uh, we are so far from that now, as several of the panelists have noted, the the um, massive amounts of money that go through the federal government uh, just could not have been envisioned, I think, by the framers. And so part of the problem that we have, that the courts have, uh, as they interpret the Constitution by whatever lights they choose to do so, is that the, the post-New Deal uh, and, and post-federal income tax world in which we live is a, is a wildly uh, different world. I would note one other aspect of all this, which is part of what made some of the original compromise less problematic, perhaps, to the framers than we now see its effects to be, some of us anyway, is that migration patterns couldn't have been predicted. And uh, migration patterns could have turned out either with most states having fairly equivalent populations or different states than we now have with different natural resources having disproportionately larger small populations. And so that's another aspect of this that, for me, makes a, a revert to a, a strict originalism uh, very problematic. So I'll go back to my favorite provision, which is the spending power. There's, there's language there. Uh, there's not the same post-New Deal by law uh, to be tinkered with there. We're able, I think, still, even in the face of some recent decisions, uh, for a court that was interested to do so, that accepted this redistribution as a problem uh, to attempt to do something uh, with the language that that text provides. Very briefly, I think we just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, uh, Professor Barnett has asked a question. He, he says, since the Senate won't be changed under Article 5, are Sandy and Lynn concerned about the political firestorm that would result from any effort to change the Senate by some extra constitutional, which I would think means unconstitutional means, such as the national referendum proposed by Professor Amar. Quick thoughts on that from the group, and and I guess and I guess we'll hear from we'll somebody hear from here. Somebody we're here over time. time. Yeah, sure, there'd be a firestorm. Um, you know, academics aren't going to bring this about. That. The, I mean, let's take the national referendum or the constitutional convention that I want. That will occur if and only if we, the people in general, in a non romantic sense, that is, lots and lots of people around the country are really so upset that they would accept the possibility of some radical thinking where radical can be both radical right or radical left and saying, you know, to what degree does the 1787 constitution serve as well today? I can tell you as somebody who's been writing about this for 20 years, it's not only like swimming upstream, it's like swimming up a waterfall. There is not widespread public opinion that something needs to be done. And if and only if public opinion shifts, do any of these 
have the possibility of becoming a truly public issue, and who knows what the public response would be. Uh, this is Lynn. I, 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 I share Sandy's view. Uh, I, I don't agree with him that uh, we ought to be having this constitutional convention. Uh, I was in law school with Akil, and I have respect for him, but I, I don't share his view on the national referendum as a source uh, of, of, of useful change here. I'm, in general, uh, not fearful of, of the referendum uh, system, direct democracy I've written about. I, I, I think good things can come from it. But um, uh, honestly, here, I, I really do think um, extra constitutional, uh, it's not really the firestorm. I just think motivating the public about a structural issue is, is not really going to be very, uh, very motivating to them. And if we have some national referendum that's motivated by a substantive issue, I'm not sure we're going to get to the right place because the concerns we've been talking about are, are structural and not issue, issue specific. Thank you. John? Yeah, I actually, uh, I'm surprised my uh, colleagues are so uh, pessimistic about the possibility of change. Uh, I would say extra constitutional, as Randy calls, I would just say, uh, you know, create creatively during the within the constitutional system. So just an example of what you could do. And it reminds me of this national popular vote initiative that some states are pushing to try to get around the Electoral College. Um, suppose you had senators who ran on a platform such as this and said, I vote, I will as senator vote to approve anything the House decides to do because I don't like the anti-democratic features of the Senate. And over time, you could see the Senate just becoming a rubber stamp, much in the way the House of Lords over time in England has become more ceremonial. I think the reason why that wouldn't happen is because I'm not convinced that if you put up to a vote of the national population, uh, the idea of getting rid of the Senate or changing even the two senators, for say, I'm not I'm not sure it would pass. Uh, I think uh, I think a lot of people in the country kind of probably like the way that things are, aren't open to really radically altering uh, the rules of the game. And, and so I, 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 but I do think you could, you could achieve this kind of change within constitutional rules, but I just don't really, not, it's not just, as Sandy says, just as academics aren't going to get anywhere. I just don't really sense, aside from odd claims by people running for various presidential offices who don't get to the, through even one or two states of the primaries, I don't really see a lot of appetite for change. If there were, people could do it within the constitutional rules as they exist now. Uh, okay, I guess that's the view from uh, Berkeley, California. On, uh, <laughs> hey, hey, no, call, no, no name throwing, <laughs> name throwing now. <laughs> uh, we, I think we've heard from our Californian about you know uh, what what you all think of the Senate. Uh, we're probably just about out of time. Uh, any closing remarks or you know parting remarks from anybody? Okay, well, I just want to say John, good job, Judge. Something? Good, I'm sorry. Well, I just say. Good job. Thanks a lot oh, for well, uh, no, walking us all no, through the, uh, you know, no, walk through this. Uh, well, I, I really think that uh, the comments by by each one of you were extraordinarily thoughtful. I feel like I learned a lot. Uh, uh, I think we heard about some things that some of us hadn't heard about before. Problems with the Senate, um, uh, ways that it adversely affects people in states that uh, I haven't lived in for a while. And um, uh, and I uh, so I thought there were really provocative, uh, provocative, insightful comments all around. Uh, genuinely, a fun discussion uh, from for me at least. So I guess uh, I'm not sure how to shut it down, but I think we're right up on the time. I want to thank each one of you for for the time you obviously put into this. I want to thank the Federal Society, and I want to thank my alma mater, the University of Michigan Law School. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't have. Uh, uh, showed you uh, uh, what our school in, uh, is like, but uh, hopefully we can get you to Ann Arbor on another occasion. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. And I guess we'll, we just turn things off.